I love x rays for more than this blueberry muffin. <laughs> X-rays are close to the hearts of many of us, but what happens when X-rays go bad? In this video, we'll be looking at how crystallographic techniques used to study proteins can lead to radiation damage. To determine the structure of a protein, X-ray crystallography can be used. At Diamond, X-ray radiations created by accelerating electrons allow a large ring-shaped tunnel close to the speed of light, so they emit energy in the form of X-rays. At various points around the ring, X-rays are diverted off into separate beam lines. Using a complex array of magnets and mirrors, a monochromatic beam of X-rays is focused into a narrow beam and directed at the crystal. Universally, the dose is defined as the energy absorbed per unit mass of sample in the irradiated volume. The dose received by the crystal is measured in grays, which are equivalent to joules per kilogram. The dose a crystal receives is of the order of mega grays. At 100 Kelvin, the amount of damage is proportional to the absorption coefficients. The dose postulate states that there exists a universal dose limit, the maximum energy per mass, that a macromolecular crystalline sample can tolerate before the diffraction will fade to half of the original intensity. Crystals might not survive up to this dose, but certainly it is not expected that they survive beyond it. We love X-rays! So what can you tell us about the historical background of radiation damage? So historically, radiation damage on protein crystals was first studied in 1962 by Blake and Phillips. They used crystals from sperm whale myoglobin and monitored the decay of the diffraction intensity over 300 hours. They observed that the damage was proportional to irradiation time and thus suggested that the protein undergoes specific structural damage. This is really remarkable because at that point in time they did not know the sequence of the protein or its 3D structure. These results were confirmed much later using electron density difference maps where it was observed that desulfide bridges were broken by the radiation. In the 1980s, it was also observed that cooling crystals help much to reduce the damage, which is why cryocooling at 100 Kelvin is now common practice. Even though this is now very often or almost always done, a lot of artifacts are still produced due to radiation damage. We've come here to the Diamond Light Synchrotron, just south of Oxford, to find out how X-ray crystallography really works. Oh look, there it is! Oh wow, it's really large! I thought it would be bigger. come here to the diamond light cell synchrotron to find out why. Firstly, the protein has to be crystallised. Then, the crystal is irradiated with x-rays, resulting in a diffraction pattern caused by the interaction between x-rays and electrons. This pattern is then used to create an electron density map of the protein. A model structure is generated by a computer based on this electron density map. The model is then refined by comparing the predicted electron density of this model with the experimental data, adjusting as necessary. We love x-rays! If an electron receives an especially high dose of radiation, either by absorbing a photon or by inelastic scattering with a photon, it may be excited enough that it becomes unbound and is ejected from the atom. The X-ray photon removes an electron from one of the inner shells of the atom. Effectively, this results in an excited state atom, as there is a vacancy for an electron. One of the electrons in the outer shells can move down to fill this gap, but in doing so it must give up some energy as it would be moving down to a lower energy level. This excess energy can be given to another electron, which is ejected from the atom. 
The electron that is ejected is known as a secondary electron, and the effect is known as the Auger effect. When an electron moves around its molecule, it can induce further ionization of other parts of the molecule, resulting in the creation of free radicals, and up to 500 secondary electrons. This results in a change to the crystal structure. There are two types of damage we observe coming from X-ray radiation, global damage and specific damage. Global damage results in fainter spots on the diffraction pattern, as well as an expansion of the unit cell. Moreover, we see an increase in the B values on an atomic level as well as the data level, and can even observe a rotation of the protein in the crystal. Specific damage is of more importance when trying to work out the biological activity of our molecules. There are three main types of specific damage. Firstly, the disulfide bonds inside the protein start to stretch before breaking apart completely. This is followed by a second effect, where we see decarboxylation of aspartate and glutamate residues, as well as the hydroxylation of the tyrosine residues. Thirdly and finally, we see the sulfur-carbon bonds inside the methionine residues starting to break apart. In this clip, we see the decarboxylation of glutamate residues after the protein has been subjected to a radiation dose of 10.31 megagram. The red mesh given by the electron density difference map indicates that the model contains electron density which is missing from the experimental data. X-ray damage of crystals is the major cause of unsuccessful multiple wavelength anomalous dispersion structure determination. For proteins that are highly sensitive to radiation, it's not possible to collect a complete data set from one crystal. Moreover, separating enzyme mechanisms from consequences of radiation damage is sometimes very hard. We love x-rays. We indeed love x-rays. Bernard, yes. do you love x-rays? I don't like one, especially like if they one. come together with crystals. <laughs>